Hello and welcome to Office Hours, a live component of the facility where good old Professor Kyle opens up his blast doors and allows you, my nerdy faculty staff, and wanders by. How did you even get here to ask old Kyle here? He feels old. Any questions, sciencey, nerdy, simpy kind of thing that you want, I'll answer it to the best of my ability off the top of my head because this is live. And as we are wont to do on Office Hours, we are also going to be talking about a number of sciencey topics this week. Things that interested me or I think need more explanation. Things like this or things like this or things like that. But before we get into all that, if you want to join the facility, if you want to continue on this conversation, even after this video, you can go to patreon.com slash Kyle Hill and join the facility today. If you do so, you get access to our members only discord. You get behind the scenes photos where I usually post my hands covered in blood or something like I did the other day. Um, uh, you get to join uh, all of our little groups on discord, all this great stuff. Uh, and that's patreon.com slash Kyle Hill as my security team is putting in the chat right now please respect the security team because they will straight up ban you one of them is a sentient bucket i don't know how it happened it just involved a lot of crossbreeding of buckets so before we get uh to everything today i just wanted to mention that today's stream will be a lot more focused on you and your questions i i didn't find i didn't find a whole lot that was super interesting to me this week but we'll be going at length um, looking at the new COVID-19 vaccines because I think it's very important and we'll be going through all the... that. And if you really, really want me to see your comment, you can super chat as you're seeing everyone do now. I will uh, try the best of my ability to see all these super chats, but I, if I do not get to them, A, I am sorry, and two, you're still simping for science, which is great. You should see, you should see what's coming up this week and what I did with... Almost 3,000 magnets. Thank you, facility staff. Uh, so, as an example of that, Mr. Diglett, always supportive, uh, one of my most frequent supporters with the 20. Chef Smoke, one of my oldest facility staff members, uh, who says, Why is it I forget when I, what I'm looking for when I go into the walk-in freezer? You said this in our Discord too, Chef. I didn't have a straight-up answer, although I'm guessing... When you, when you do a lot of routine actions, say, I'm going to take an example of uh, driving on the highway. Sometimes when you're driving on the highway, something very routine, very rote, it becomes so routine that it actually is rerouted into your subconscious, where your consciousness can kind of uh, tend to other tasks and other stimuli out in the world, which is why you, you get to driving, and then 30 minutes later, after you're just thinking about yourself, you're like, you know, wow. I really judge my self-worth based on Instagram likes. And then you just get there like, wow, I don't even remember driving at all. That's because you really weren't consciously driving. It's only in, it's only when something interrupts that process and consciousness must once again intrude on your life that you start paying attention. You're like, whoa, what, what happened? So I'm guessing that since you're a chef and you go, uh, you know, you're, you're cooking all the time, you're doing these things all the time, I'm guessing that during these rote actions, a blast of cold air kind of wakes you up from that subconscious stupor and you forget what you were looking for or what your subconscious was doing. That would be my guess, but what do I know? I I can hardly boil water. Elizabeth Calvert always with the 20 says, tiny human, almost seven. Oh, hello, little one. Decided to draw the solar system this week uh, on his own without help. Drew the planets correctly. Even a red spot on old Jupa Jupe. Nice, now that's a big storm. And in correct order, and could name them. I'm a proud science mom. This is why I sim for science. See, that's that, it's about the kids. As we'll get to a little bit later on, things are looking pretty dire for this generation. So uh, we'll get to it. Um, Reese Sands with the ten says, "Hey Kyle, love the show. Imagine the rabies virus became airborne. Not a question, just a terrible reoccurring dream I sometimes have, sharing the terror. Well, let me scare you a little bit more. There is nothing right now." that would prevent, in theory, another pandemic that is much more infectious and much more deadly. Nothing. We got lucky, quote-unquote. And, and I know with COVID-19, that sounds very um, dismissive of everything that's happening, but there is no evolutionary reason why it couldn't be as deadly as Ebola and as uh, infectious as something like measles. And measles is so infectious that if you say, if someone with measles was in an elevator and then got out, if you got into that elevator like 10 minutes later, it can infect up to 15 people. It's crazy infectious. So there's nothing to prevent that from happening. Although 
there is to some extent a way we can mitigate it if we really learn the lessons of this pandemic. And speaking of which, before we get into, into any more simpies, let's go on to our first topic. Yeah, new transitions, pretty cool, right? Yeah, something was going wrong with the with the blast doors. They weren't opening, and some guy with the same hairdo kept trying to cut through them. <laughs> uh, he must have been drinking. That's why they call him Qui Gon Jin. I'm sure. Anyway, the COVID. Shut up. The COVID nineteen vaccines. I, I'm sure you've heard a lot of bit about this in the news recently because all of us, um, in the medical community, just everybody. We, we want a vaccine to happen because this is, the really, this is really the only way we're going to get ahead of this pandemic and start stamping it down out of existence. Social distancing will not be enough. Locking down will not be enough. We need something to actively give people protection. When people say something like herd immunity, just let everyone get it, that's, that's dumb. That's not how that works. I'm sorry, it's, it's just not. And it kind of throws potentially millions of people under the bus of death and you call yourself a moral person person guy on twitter says like oh just let all the old people die this is why social media is a bad thing anyway so you may have heard and you can see through my <laughs> my semi-invisible body i was playing with the invisibility cloaks i know i saw i saw daniel radcliffe's latest movie and i was like that would be fun <laughs> Anyhow, so you may have heard a lot about COVID vaccines recently, two specifically, one from a company called Moderna and one from another uh, called Pfizer, these big super pharma, big pharma companies. And what's really exciting about these is that in recent human testing, which is far down along the testing chain, there's a lot of other things you got to do first before you start uh, injecting humans with stuff because that's dangerous. The Moderna and Pfizer vaccines are... 95 and 90% effective, respectively. And to put that into context, the yearly flu vaccine is around, when it's good, 60% effective. It's only 60% effective, I say only, because each year, scientists and biologists have to guess what the new mutated strain is going to look like, and their best guess will give the best efficaciousness for that vaccine. But this is obviously a lot, lot more effective, and what this would translate into is tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of lives saved, if not millions. So it's very, very promising. And the human trials that have gone on so far uh, have included as well high-risk people, people at very high risk for getting and succumbing to COVID-19. So with studies like that in pocket, we can feel very confident that a vaccine like this will be effective and save a lot of lives. Um, and for each company, they're planning on rolling out about a billion doses each. I think Moderna total, when you break it down, Moderna total internationally is thinking about a billion and uh, Pfizer about 1.3 billion. That's great. But it gets complicated, and that's why I wanted to talk about this, because it's, not, it's, it's also not going to be as simple as just making all the vaccines. How do you distribute these vaccines? Again, that sounds trivial, but I can assure you it is very much not. One billion things need to be deliver, delivered to people, and these vaccines uh, each require two doses for proper um, immunity. Two doses of billions of vaccines, that's going to take just a lot of... A, a, a staggering amount of coordination and logistics to make that happen. And that is all complicated by the fact, and you may have read this in the news too, which is why uh, the incoming administration in America has, is stressing the outgoing administration like, look, you need a plan for this because this is going to get complicated. Vaccines like this need uh, what they call cold chains, which is just a fancy, cool engineering way of saying they need to be refrigerated from production all the way to delivery. So they cannot be warmed up. Once they warm up, their shelf life decreases dramatically. So even, uh, so while these vaccines could exist on like a shelf, much like an elf, um, they wouldn't last very long at ambient temperatures. So rather, the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines need to be cooled down to up to negative 
70 degrees Celsius. The Moderna one is much better in this regard, about negative 20 degrees Celsius, but that is very, very, very cold. And so when you think about the logistics on top of just the distribution, now everything has to be chilled with special equipment, special um, cooling trucks and containers and all this stuff. Everything gets really, really complicated. But the light at the end of the tunnel here, as Dr. Fauci would say, is that this has been a monumental success in terms of the science going on here. The entire world is rushing to do very complicated science and deliver it to uh, in a, uh, such a large amount of people. It's really amazing. Um, most vaccines, I think, go through a, de a development period of like five years. This is 10 months. That's nuts. And, it, and it, it's that one silver lining where, you know, for how many things have gone wrong in 2020, you can still, we know that science still works. We can, we, can, we can come together, we can do the science, and we can help solve grand um, public health problems. And that leads me into the next part of this discussion, which is how do these vaccines work? I am very, very worried that much, well, at least in the United States, but much like mask wearing is in the United States, I'm very, very worried that vaccine administration is going to be a political thing and it's going to be a conspiracy theory thing. So to head that off at the pass, I know it's still going to happen because America is conspiracy ridden. It's affecting our brains like syphilis. So to head that off at the pass, I want to explain exactly what these vaccines are going to do. And this applies generally to vaccines, but in particular, the COVID-19 vaccine. So the, let's take the Moderna vaccine. The, the Moderna vaccine is taking bits of mRNA, which is messenger RNA, and RNA is one half of the double helix strip of DNA. So we take that out, and this messenger RNA codes for proteins. That's what it does in the body. So uh, in your body, your cells go to the DNA instructions in the nucleus of your cells, it goes along, it does a little, it you know, puts on its tiny little glasses and it starts reading the DNA. And as it reads the DNA, it spits out this RNA strip and that RNA strip goes on to get uh, transcribed and then produces, oh, these are the proteins that make up the genes on this part of the DNA. So let's send that off to a little protein factory. I'm being a little bit general here, I know. Send that off to a little bit, uh, to a little protein factory, makes the protein, then the body uses that protein for basically anything. Everything is protein-based in the body, pretty much. But in this case, what the mRNA inside of these vaccines is coding for are these spike proteins. So on the COVID-19, uh, on COVID-2 here, COVID virus, it uses proteins on the, on the outside of this virus to uh, attach into and then infiltrate human cells. Once it's inside those human cells, it uses its own genetic code to replicate itself. But you see how the science is being tricky here? We're saying, well, instead of waiting for that to happen and for your body to com be completely infected, let's just make these proteins so that if your body, if we produce those proteins in your body, your immune system will go, hey, 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 uh, let me see some ID. And then it will start remembering those proteins. It will start creating antibodies, which is kind of like this dictionary of, oh, yeah, that's bad. We should kill that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're getting around being infected by COVID by giving our bodies kind of like uh, the calling card of COVID. So once the vaccine does this, our bodies will be primed so that the next time an actual virus tries to infect our cells, the body's like, oh, wait a second there, buddy. I saw your ID before. Definitely fake. You're, <laughs> you, you look like you're 10, not 31. And then your body will mount an immune response and hopefully deal with it before it becomes a full-blown infection. The other good thing about these vaccines as they've been tested right now is that there haven't been any real safety concerns uh, beyond the safety concerns that have always been associated with vaccines in general, 
um, you know, perhaps some dizziness, some redness or soreness at the infection site. These are very common side effects. And I will say, uh, just so you know, no vaccine is 100% safe. There are side effects. There's always going to be serious side effects that are very, very rare. But this is, this is what public health means. When it comes to vaccines, when people are like, well, the flu vaccine is only 60% effective and it might, you know, it might have side effects. That, those are both true. But we need, don't think as a human, think as, a, as humanity. Quote, don't think as a human, think as humanity when it comes to public health. There might be a small percentage of individuals that have some adverse reaction, but on the whole, in terms of humanity, in terms of the billions of us that there are, you are literally saving hundreds of thousands, if not millions of lives. It's a trade-off. It is a moral and bio it's a, it's a bioethical trade-off. We're saying we are willing to accept very unlikely and rare cases for stamping out a pandemic. And I think if you go through the ethics of that yourself, you'd probably agree. The other, th the other fun thing about this Moderna vaccine is that uh, our Lord and Savior Dolly Parton also donated a million dollars to this Moderna vaccine. Dolly, not only is she one of the greatest country recording artists of all time, inarguably, She's funding vaccine studies. She's making whole libraries in her hometowns and stuff for, you know, underprivileged kids to read where like 3,000 kids can get access to books. She's great. Now for the timeline, it's going to be a while. I, even though I said, you know, 10, well, I said 10 months is amazing. It's amazingly fast for a vaccine to be produced and implemented. Um, so... We shouldn't expect it to be instantaneous. Moderna is looking to have some available, a uh, few million doses available before the end of the year, which is, again, incredible, and most of the stock available next year. So what do we have to do? Well, in the meantime, especially in the United States, we must flatten the curve again. I don't know what happened. Well, I, I mean, I know what happened. At least in the United States, at least from my perspective, when this started getting really bad, the pandemic, start, pandemic started getting really bad, March, April, we did, we kind of came together and listened to the experts and started flattening the curve and really locked down. But because this has lasted so long and human attention spans are short and social media is so polarizing, for whatever reason, our attention, we, we couldn't maintain this attention and we couldn't go through this for the long haul. And so people started going out again, people started ignoring, people started gathering, and now we are in the middle of the worst part of the pandemic since its start. More people died last week from COVID-19 than during 9-11, and that happens every week now. So I know it's morbid, but you need this context, and it, and it gives me the context to say, if we don't do anything, it's going to get a lot worse before it gets better. The virus does not care about your holiday plans. The virus does not care about Christmas. Don't help it. Do science a solid here and do a solid for all, all the healthcare workers that are working 36 hour shifts that are collapsing in emotional distress, that are having to call sobbing mothers to say that their daughter is definitely not going to make it and you can't come see her. Do science a solid, do them a solid, and stay home this holiday season. Wait for the vaccine. We can do this. We know how this works. And we know that if you don't continue to social distance and you don't follow these guidelines, it's... There's a fallacy here that isn't helping, of course, where if you don't know anyone personally that is dealing with this, then you don't really care. There's no, there's no salience there for you. But... It's going to rapidly become the case that you know somebody. So, stay home for the holidays, please. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness gracious, please. <laughs> hey, I got the blast doors working. We have uh, Matt Creel, 95, frequent commenter. It says, best health advice for traveling during the holidays. 
Please don't. I agree. Uh, Pseudofiction says, I think COVID-19 looks very jolly, if you ask me. Well, no one asked you. It does look a little Christmas or ornamenty, but so does most virus. Don't, don't humanize a virus. It's, because it won't humanize you. Lou Tora Franca says, quote, never forget really doesn't mean as much anymore, does it? Well, no, do, do not conflate me bringing up 9-11 as an example with me not caring about it. I'm bringing up a statistical comparison to, to try to equate the emotion here, right? The emotional levels that we went through during those terrible attacks are valid, of course. But what we're not seeing is an outpouring of support uh, for victims and healthcare workers in our, in our failing healthcare system right now. When it's projected by, in six months, about half a million Americans will be dead. I'm saying we need to care more about what's going on now, not less about what happened. Don't, don't try it. No, don't try to don't try to do that to me. Flaky Jakey with the Australian oh Flaky Junk with the Australian fifty dollars says oh, let me let me <laughs> You don't have to do the accent, but it would be appreciated. Okay, I, I read it first to see if it was gonna be sad. But here we go. Just spent five months in one of the harshest lockdowns on the planet in Melbourne, Australia. That was bad. We're now nineteen days without new infections because our state premier went hard at the problem. You don't have to do the accent, but it would be appreciated. It's, it's, it's very easy to see where they are taking lockdowns in the science seriously. You see an immediate reduction in cases. Um, and it, was there another place in Australia that went, it's now like 13 days or so without a single case or death? That's not magic. That's lockdown. And the economic uh, argument for not locking down is definitely not there yet. Luke Colley with a $30 says, My uncle is adamant that no one has ever set foot on the moon. What can I say to prove that the moon landings happened? He argues that Russians have not landed on the moon and we can't see anything on the moon with telescopes. Um. Okay. I would say, well, and you can look up videos of this, but when we went to the moon, we did some science on the moon. And we left things called retro reflectors on the moon. And what a retro reflector is, it's like a mirror, but instead of uh, reflecting back off at any direction, it reflects exactly back at the angle um, so which it would come right back to the source. And so right now, astronomers can measure the distance of the moon, how it varies over course of time, by shooting powerful lasers at these retro reflectors on the moon that were placed there by human beings and you get signals back. That would not be the case if you were just shooting March, uh, lunar regolith, rather. So you can see physical spots on the moon. We can prove there are physical places on the moon where human-made objects are. Short of going there yourself, Mr. Uncle, what do you want? What, uh, rather, because I don't know your uncle, I, I would say this. St I, I start conspiracy theory conversations like this. Ask them... Is there any evidence that would change your mind definitively? And it's like, oh, yeah, well, if you could say that this happened or you could show that that happened, then, yes, I would change my mind. But if their answer is like, no, I'm really sure, there's nothing that could change my mind. It's like, all right, well, enjoy your latte, you know. It's not, there's no conversation to be had there. Foxus with the 10 says, hey, what is more efficient, cook wather in electric kettle or on stove or in microwave? What is more energy efficient? Um, hmm. Well, I don't know. I'm going to guess it's in the microwave to heat up water um, because microwaves literally move the molecules around and heat it up uh, like that kinetically, where um, boiling water, water has a very high heat capacity, so if you're just putting heat on water, it does take a long time for water to start boiling, where... Uh, it would take about like 35 seconds to boil water in a cup in the microwave, but longer than that because of the high heat capacity of water on a stove. But of course, it depends on your stove and your, you know what I mean. 
Boise Freerunner says, when will it be an episode on hypercubes and or interdimensional storage? Are you the one in my Discord who asks about hypercubes every day? I don't know. I looked into it already. And we'll see. I already know the, the avatar for this one. Grim Reaper of Trolls with the 999 who says, hey, Kyle, how and when are vaccines warmed up to be injected? I don't know th that they are. I think they they stay in storage. And, well, some vaccines stay in cold storage um, for a long time to uh, prolong their shelf life, but vaccines ready to be administered can stay on the shelf of something like a pharmacy for, like, a month. So you, you, you cold chain it to the pharmacies, and then you get it uh, applied to people rather quickly. Sagey boy 47 with the $20, no message, just pure class. Elizabeth Calvert again with the 20 says, Science, it's like magic, only real. <laughs> there's, I mean, there's no such thing as magic, even. Everything, I, what I've said before, and I'll say again, is, is more like this. Uh, everything doesn't happen for a reason, but there's a reason that everything happens. There's a difference. Underdog with the Australian five dollars says, "Hey Kyle, love the show. I I count a moon landing deniers by denying the existence of the moon itself. Oh, you believe that the moon is real? That's that's Hornswoggle. Oh, I don't know what Australians say. Is that was that close? <laughs> Getting confirmation from Kevin that that is a real term in Australia. VCD with the twenty says, "Hola Kyle, me encanta tu programas." says, it saddens me to admit that I know people who are already saying that they won't get the vaccine because it's a plan to kill people. I've tried to explain it, but it's pointless. Um, even sadder, there are a lot of reports from uh, nurses on the front line saying that they have people actively dying in ICU beds, still denying that they even have COVID-19. And that, in America, I think less speaks to the intelligence of people and more to the incredible polarization that has gone on in regards to this topic um which is why this is so that kind of rhetoric is so poisonous and so dangerous stylo ren with the 10 says finally got to catch an office hours live ah, hope you're having a good day eh. i know i am btc is having a great day today and i get to simp for science live oh yes hey welcome welcome to the club i love it Joseph Murphy with the 10 says, The moon landing was faked, filmed by Stanley Kubrick, but he was such a stickler for authenticity, he'd demand it, it was filmed on location. Yeah, it's too bad. Have you seen CGI from, like, 1969? Doesn't look moon landing worthy, I'll tell you that. Elizabeth, again? Calm down, Elizabeth. You Use that 10 to, like, buy a, buy a peanut butter and jelly uncrustable sandwich for your little one. Uh, glad I got to see part of a live stream for the first time in a while. Keep being awesome, Kyle. I can't not. It's inherent to me. Uh, Brian Hulin says, surprise, lights! Oh, you got me. It's been a while. You know, the sad thing was, I didn't get to keep that lightsaber. Oh, well. I mean, I have a multi-billion dollar facility now, so I guess it's, you know, not that bad of a trade. Arc Trooper Lee with the 499 says, can you explain quantum tunneling? doing a physics presentation on The Flash, and this is for his phasing. Well, I did an episode on Because Science about this exact thing. Like, literally, I used The Flash to explain quantum tunneling. But uh, the quote-unquote easiest way I could explain quantum tunneling to you, I have to get a little bit closer to you first. Ooh. The easiest way, oh, and we have a we have a hundred coming in, so I'm getting to that. The easiest way to explain quantum tunneling is that a quanta, a particle, like a photon, is not like a ball. Uh, the traditional Newtonian mechanics would, would say that it's like a ball that bounces off stuff, but that's not quite true. In the quantum mechanical representation of a particle, it's more like a distribution of probability. So I'm, I'm making a bell curve here. With, um, if, this, if, if the x-axis was position, at a bell curve of possibilities, you know, the majority of possibilities is that the photon is going to be here, and then it's much less likely as you go out to be here or here. But it can be, probabilistically, in any of this space, which is why orbiting electrons around a nucleus isn't an accurate picture. It's not like little basketballs or little uh, moons orbiting a planet. It is more like a 
cloud of possibility, which is weird, but so is quantum mechanics. Now, the, the, the best way I can explain this to you in a simple way would be to, again, imagine a bell curve. Don't think of a little ball particle, think of a bell curve. And imagine this particle, this, this uh, wave of probability, now encounters something like a wall, a barrier. When this probability function encounters an object, you can see that if I encounter this object, say, and I and reflect off of it, when this interacts, there will be, as you can see by the tips of my fingers here, there will be some small amount of probability that when this bounces off, you're not going to find the particle here. You're going to find it where my fingers are on the other side of the wall. And that's because the probability function actually distributes itself past the wall. It is unlikely to happen, but it does happen. And so when you have so many interacting particles, you know, an uncountable number of photons, there's a decent chance that they will quantum tunnel through a barrier without having classically enough energy to do so. And that sounds crazy, but this happens so frequently in large masses. This is how the sun actually fuses matter together. The sun does not have the temperature and the gravity classically to sustain nuclear fusion. Instead, what we understand now is that there is so much quantum tunneling going on with particles being getting uh, to be able to be closer than they otherwise should be. That's how fusion in the sun happens. So fusion, the all life on Earth is, you could say, owed to quantum tunneling. So I hope that answers your question. Uh, I gotta get, I see people, but I gotta get to Morgan Ousley with the $100 donation. You are a fantastic family man. I'm just looking at your avatar. You look like a pretty family, too. You kind of look like one of those in, that, that is already in the frame. That you're like, maybe I won't take it out. <laughs> Morgan, with the 100, says, Hey, Kyle, love the new-ish channel. Yeah, it's been... It's been something. I feel I'm the knockoff Loki to your YouTube Thor. Long hair, baby face, and all. Hey, I'm a man, not a baby. Just wanted to say, keep it up. Keep up the great supervillain work, Simp for Science. A, how dare you hate. B, thank you so much. I hope uh, you and your family are doing absolutely fantastic. And if you want to meet me some number of years in the future at a Comic-Con when people can gather again and dress as Thor and Loki, I'll think about it. If I remember, which I won't. Uh, I know it seems like I'm not getting to another topic, but I don't have many topics this week. I want to talk to you this week because this week was boring to me. Although there's a Baby Yoda doll on the space station now, that's kind of fun. Pinking554 with the 10 says, What do you think of people like me who don't wear a mask unless, I, unless I'm unless i in an indoor public space or can't social distance? Um, what do I think of you? Um, I, I cannot pass judgment on you unless I know your exact situations that you're putting yourself in. Um, if you can't social distance, you wear a mask. Uh, if you're in an indoor public place, wear a mask. But... Um, Say if you're outside walking, well, what I do, um, if I'm going for a run or something like that, if I am very far away from people, and we've gone through this in office hours where when you're breathing heavy and you're running, for example, your trail of possible infection is much longer than six feet. It's like 30 or 15 feet. So if I'm like 30 or 15 feet away from everybody and the sidewalks are totally clear, I will take the mask off one ear, hold it there and run so I can breathe better. But if there's anybody in my sight line and I know I'm going to pass them. I cover it up many seconds beforehand, then I pass them. Um, fizzy, fizzily, physically, that should be enough distance. Um, so I, I would say do your absolute best. Um, but if you really think you're not going to be able to follow the guidelines as best you can, I, I, would, I would avoid those situations. Thomas Hadrick with the 20 says, 3,000 neodymium magnets, uh, particle accelerator, certain scientific railgun, when? You say that. For, first, I think uh, my femme fatale, Thea, and I will be building what I think will be a world first. 
and very cool to look at with all those magnets. So we'll see what happens. Taylor Clark with a 10, and let's pause the Super Chats. We'll get to uh, one of our last topics here. Taylor Clark with the 10 says, what are some examples of thing you, things you do to romanticize your life? Like, if I was writing a novel and I was talking about me all lusciously. No, I know that's not what you mean. I actually don't know what you mean. Romanticize my life, like make my life feel more romantic. I don't know. I'm not like super into me right now. You know? You know what I mean? So, nothing? I mean, Arya is pretty nice to me. And I, I drink a lot of wine. Peer review. So, as I am wont to do on every episode of Office Hours, I take one of your comments that I found funny or interesting or, huh? As in the case of this one. From the last episode of the facility, which was, I showed you my new kitty. The Distinguished Lady 3 Jane Marie France Tessier Ashpool. And, uh, I got this new kitty because, oh. Anyway, I got a new kitty. And, um, her claws are so sharp that I am shredded. No. <laughs> Not just this. But I'm shredded. From head to toe. Her claws are so sharp, it's stupid. Um, and she's very active, so... It, I had the thought to myself, like, how are your claws so sharp? And then I went, ding. So I made an episode about why cat's claws are so sharp, and the answer might surprise you, and that's not clickbait. I did not know how cat's claws grew and functioned until I researched it, so you might want to check out that video. But on that video, Matt Richmond commented, I was really hoping this video would cover why cat scratches are the only scratches that get at all inflamed and hurt real bad. I know that they have po I know that they have poison, but was wondering what kind of poison. That's what I'm getting at. So obviously we have a lot to get to. First of all, Matt, your premise. Are cat scratches the only scratches that hurt from animals? I'm gonna guess totally not. I'm imagining if you got kicked by an emu, that that would certainly mess up your day. Or got scratched by a lion. Oh, that's also a cat. Uh, frickin' Komodo dragon. I'm sure that would be terrible. Second of all, I know they have poison. Now, I'm not trying to make fun of you here, Matt, but I have never heard anyone think that. But, to be fair, I looked up this claim on the internet, and apparently a lot of, a lot of people think cat's claws are poisonous. So... Okay, that's a common thought. Fine. It's not, it's not your fault. But thirdly, they're not poisonous. What I think people are doing, and this is totally quote-unquote rational without more information, is people are seeing that they have a bad reaction to a cat scratch, and then they say, it must be poisonous. But what makes more sense? We know that cats aren't poisonous and not venomous so what could be an alternative explanation for getting a cut that lasts a long time you can see one on me which is characteristic of cat cuts and now that you mention it and i i do agree now where it does seem to be much deeper redder and last a lot longer than other cuts that i've gotten on my body from making totally not super villainy things so there is some there there but likely what it is, is that many people are allergic to cats, and cats have a lot of stuff in their saliva. And they lick every part of their body all the time for hours a day, including their claws and their little peats. So the more logical explanation, in fact, probably the exact explanation, is that you're getting bacteria from cat mouths, from when they're cleaning up after themselves in the litter box, some of that is on their claws, and when it scratches you, some of that bacteria gets into the wound and makes it hurt and or be infected or painful more often than other claws that uh, do not have those properties. For a long time, as an interesting counterpoint, for a long time we thought that Komodo dragon bites were exactly that. Where, excuse me, where Komodo dragon mouths were so dirty, had so much bacteria, that when they bit 
something like a young wildebeest, that the bite would immediately cause like a blood infection, like sepsis, and that would help kill the animal. But surprisingly, just a few years, we, uh, through CT scans and autopsies and stuff, we found out that Komodo dragons actually have venom glands, and there is actual venom in a Komodo dragon bite. So this is an interesting example of that being the opposite. But in this case, cats are not poisonous. What they're likely doing is getting bacteria into their skin when they scratch you a lot. And this, uh, this, this kind of reminds me of, you know, why is, for example, uh, a paper cut so painful? Well, you know, a cat claw isn't exactly a scalpel or a razor blade. And when, and when cuts are more jagged um, and deep, you can have more pain associated with it, like a paper cut. You know, the surface of paper, when you look at it, pretty jagged up close, mi microscopically. So I think a combination of those factors, not being perfectly sharp, going pretty deep, probably having bacteria on their claws, I think that's probably the explanation. And I know this from personal experience that it's not just cats. I mean, if, if I bit you, Matt, there's a good chance the bite would become infected because there's a lot of bacteria and many, many flora and fauna in your mouth. Well, just flora. Many flora in your mouth. And if I bit you, it's a good chance the same thing would happen. But I am not poisonous as much. Kevin. Mouth guards with poison. One time I punched a kid in the face and uh, his braces cut me. Uh, and that became kind of uh, infected. Not a bad one, but, you know, had some pus and stuff. So, that happened. So, for leading us on this little discussion, forget about the me punching a kid in the mouth thing. I wasn't my, I was also a kid. I don't punch kids that don't deserve it. So, for making me incriminate myself uh, to the fullest extent of the law, Matt Richmond, you are now an honorary member of the facility. And if you're watching right now, you can DM me. You have to figure out how to do that first. It's a, it's a check. You can DM me, and I will give you a free month's membership to the facility Discord. And you can see every weird thing that we get up to on there. A lot of it's like tarantula videos. And me being like, hey, how you guys doing? I'm not so great. So, Matt... Fantastic. Honorary member of the facility. Now, Kevin will bring you that young, fresh black. Wait, what? Oh, it's red. The DNA took? The mutation happened? Okay, one second, uh, faculty. I'll, I'll, I gotta take a short commercial break. One, one second. How stable is the mutation? And you say it can more or less affect any human? Well, are they, are they gonna replace the fingernails? Or are they just. Are, okay. Yeah, I can see. I mean, I don't love fingernails. Are they gonna be that big? I'm like a velociraptor. I should wear a, one of those hats and then show a kind of chubby kid in a flannel how a velociraptor will. Cut him in the forest? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that movie totally holds up. Oh, yeah, I should probably get back to the stream. Okay, yep. Climate change. Just a just a day full of fun things. So just to, uh, before I take the end comments from all of you, I wanted to quickly talk about a topic that you may have seen where um, a paper came out from scientists. Uh, actually, that's not true. A paper came out saying that we have crossed the point of no return for climate change. And what they were doing was they were using models to model the melting of the permafrost in near the polar regions. And why that is bad is that there's a lot of organic material in permafrost. Why it's called permafrost is that it's permanently frozen. Permafrost. Until the earth gets warm enough or global warming uh, raises the average global temperature enough that this always frozen soil and organic material starts to, th starts to melt. And when it starts to melt, these gases and these, ba well, these bacteria and the soil and this organic matter will start 
doing its thing again, and this produces a lot of gases. In specific, um, it will release carbon dioxide and methane. Methane is highly flammable. I don't, that's neither here nor there, but it's a very powerful greenhouse gas. They're like four times more potent as a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. So the worry is, is that once the permafrost starts to uh, melt at an accelerated rate, it will create a positive feedback loop where it will, it will put uh, methane into the atmosphere that will, in, that will accelerate climate change, which will make the earth hotter, which will melt more permafrost, which will release more methane, et cetera, et cetera. And then we pass the tipping point and then everything's terrible. That was what the study said. However, I am here to be your silver lining. Uh, climate scientists around the internet came out to debunk this study, and they had a number of reasons for doing so. First of all, uh, the scientists who published this paper were not climate scientists. They were business school professors. And as uh, journalists say, that kind of shows in the report because the models that they're using is very, very simple. Uh, the paper's models were missing, you know, uh, accurate displays of how much water vapor is in the atmosphere, um, that kind of thing. It doesn't explicitly include things like la large scale movement of air and water in the atmosphere in the ocean. It overestimates water vapor concentrations. And it basically says that. Uh, if we ended all carbon emissions today, right now, went to zero, we would still cross the tipping point where what um, other studies have said, uh, what uh, a 2009 meta-analysis said, and a meta-analysis is a study of studies, so it gathers up the conclusions of many studies to produce an even more powerful final form of study. In 2019, uh, one of those meta-analyses said uh, that immediately, in contrast to this paper again, that immediately stopping greenhouse gas emissions would drastically limit global warming. But this received far less coverage. Now, uh, talking with one of the scientists commenting on this paper, uh, quote, she said, I want to be clear, thawing permafrost, which was another red flag because these uh, business professors said melting instead of thawing because permafrost doesn't melt, which is why I was saying it before. It actually thaws. And that threw up a, le a red flag for people. So, quote, I want to be clear. Thawing permafrost is likely to result in a net increase in atmospheric methane concentrations, and methane is a potent greenhouse gas, but methane concentrations are increasing sharply right now, and it's not because of the permafrost. It's because of the oil and gas industry and large-scale agriculture, as you can see behind me. So the point that I'm getting at in bringing up this is that uh, climate coverage is a lot of gloom and doom, and I'm not here to completely alleviate that, but we have not, we are not yet helpless. We have not yet crossed the path, the point of no return. We can still do something, and drastically, it's going to be hard. We have to drastically limit our carbon emissions in a way that has never been done before in human society, but there's still time. We can still do this, and if, if not doing it for yourself on the timelines that you're considering, do it for the kids. Do it for Elizabeth Calvert. Calvert's kids in the chat, they're just sitting there eating Uncrustables. Leave them a planet that's worth eating and Uncrustables on. Dang. New transition. So for the last couple minutes of this stream, again, because we didn't have a whole lot of topics... Uh, let's get to some more of your comments and questions. Uh, at the beginning of December, we will be starting a fundraiser. Uh, I haven't uh, said for who, uh, for who and for what yet, but at the beginning of December, all Super Chats and stuff from the streams will be going towards that foundation, so stay tuned for that. Uh, this week's episode of the facility is a good one. It involves some of those many magnets that I made, and I think you'll find that I, I got some pretty beautiful footage of it. Uh, Master of All, 1294, as always, with the Australian $5, say, Hey Kyle, I had my first outdoor bouldering trip last weekend. It was super fun. Do you have any advice for improving outdoors versus indoors bouldering? Well, if you know me, you know I, I'm, I was an avid rock climber before lockdown. Um, what I would say, outdoor rock climbing is very, or bouldering rather, is very different in that the rocks feel so much different. The movement feels harder. Um... 
what I would say is that it's much easier to train inside. So if you want to get better at outside, it's not really the other way around. So you can climb a lot outside. It's not really going to translate to inside because the holds are different. And it's much more dynamic and you're a lot more fearless. Uh, I would say training much harder inside will help you outside. And what you can do if you're really ambitious is that if you're working on a project outside, go to your local gym and find a problem that's very close to that, where it has similar holds or crimps or slopers, similar body movement, Gaston's, whatever it is, and work on that to get better at doing the official slab outside. Alicia Herbert, Herbitter, every time, Alicia, I, I get that wrong, I apologize. $10, our cat is polydactyl on all four feet. She requires a kitty manicure at least once a month. It's a two-person job. P.S. Everyone wear masks, stay indoors, and wash your hands, everyone. Yes, polydactyl. So uh, Alicia's cats have uh, more digits than they otherwise would on their feet, and they have little mittens, uh, little murder mittens, they call them. Uh, fun fact, uh, we, uh, Ari and I, uh, were friends with Grant Imahara's cat, who also was uh, polydactyl on all the feet. So Grant had a polydactyl cat, which... Uh, we made sure is uh, now uh, taken good care of and accounted for. Um, Ari and I were going to uh, foster Grant's cat, but thankfully that happened even before we needed to do that. So I don't know why I'm bringing it up. Just felt like a nice thing to say. Alyssa Ronda with the 20 says, Felinosis caused by the bacterium. I, I went to this Wikipedia page too, Alyssa. Caused by the bacterium Barontella hensale. God, you're making me say hard words. We, can, we would use cat scratch fever as... Oh, wait. Oh, wait. You sound like a doctor. My bad for calling you out on the thing. We would use cat scratch fever as a differential diagnosis with some patients. Wash all animal bites and scratches, especially human. We are super gross mammals. Yes, uh, Alyssa is saying um, the... It seems like cat, claw, uh, cat scratches could be poisonous, but as Alyssa points out, it's more like cat scratch fever, which is some kind of infection from bacteria that are on the cat's claws. Thank you for pointing that out, and I apologize again for diminishing your expertise. <laughs> Adam Frost with the New Zealand 1699, I'm not even going to try that accent, who says, oh no. Hey Kyle, speaking of accents, if you want to give the Kiwi accent a go, take the Australian accent and bring the pitch all the way down. Throw in a Kira Aura and you'll be sorted. Take it easy. Hey Brett. Hey Jermaine. I told you we go to jail if you bought that cup. Hey, the Rotundas, Jermaine. Julius Caesar, 1957. Fly to the Concord, that's all I got. Kyle Trevino again, another commenter with the five, says, I was worried about your infectious bite, thinking you might be a zombie, but your hair is a bit too magnificent to allow that. Yeah, if I started turning into a zombie and uh, my hair started falling out, I would just I would I would just move to wherever Rick Grimes was and stand there. He knows what to do. Matt Creel again today with the five says, Hey Kyle, I love the show. What is the purpose of a cat's do claw? Is it for extra grip or just a vestigial digit? I actually have no, no idea. You know, the claw that is further up on their little, uh, on their little peats. I don't know. I mean, it might help when they're gripping prey, but I'm not sure. That's something for the veterinarians in the chat. Jack NSA with the Ron 25, who's watching me right now, says, What a great show with a great guy with great hair. Hey, thanks. I admit it, admittedly, a lot of you were judging me on my beardlessness last week, and it made me feel pretty bad. So thank you, Jack. A, a real, a real fan, you know. Uh, let's take some non-soupies for a second. Let's see what let's see what y'all are saying. Uh, Jason Redden says, with the five says, your cat is the best neuromancer reference ever. I know, I love that book. Everything, everything cyberpunk is derivative of that book. So if you haven't read Neuromancer, you must. Uh, we have Willie Raymer says, I'm the hip hop hippotamus. My lyrics are bottomless. Popping off the top of this esophagus right, right, off this, right in this metropolis. Whoever told you I was a water dwelling, dwelling mammal? Whoever gave you that uh, preposterous hypothesis? Did Steve tell you that? Steve. That wasn't in the comment. I just know that off the top of my head. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Redboard, um, right straight out of Doc's chat from today, says, Kyle, the beard looks good. It's gone, bread. That's the point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Athala says, notice me. Consider yourself noticed, but I will notice you more if you spray chrome on your mouth. 
Kryn, uh, one of my diehard supporters, says, Hi, admins. Hi, Kyle. Thanks, y'all, for making today less sucky. Uh, best I can do. Uh, Mike Hopman says, Top Netflix series? Uh, Ari and I last night were watching um, Our Planet, narrated by David Attenborough, because we recently increased some of the sizes of the screens in the facility, and we wanted to test out what 4K looks like, and wow, is it great. The open ocean episode of Our Planet on Netflix, recommend it. It shows an anglerfish I've never seen before in, in a ma- and, and it shows an oarfish for the first time ever live on camera. It is so cool. So cool. I want Der- David Attenborough's job, but I don't sound that cool. Here on our planet, many forms of life, including, including the Great Barrier Reef, have been put in danger. I'll stop. Joseph comments, poop. You had your time in the sun. And what did you do? Nothing. First name with the five says, hey, Kyle, have you seen the Hacksmith Channel's real life proto saber? Sorry for the duplicate, but I'm never awake at this time of night. Yes, uh, James Hobson over at the Hacksmith Channel who made had like 20 million views on the first real world lightsaber. Um, he actually texted me before he put that episode up. He's like, look at this, you nerd. I was like, nice, nerd. Uh, and I've, I've, t- I talked about this before. It's more, it's more or less just a, you know, a plasma cutter with an attachment that makes it more like a laminar flow, but it looks amazing. And he, and he did it first and yeah, it's awesome. Doesn't, it functions, it looks and it functions kind of like a lightsaber. So that's better than anyone else could do. Uh, Panasonic music with the five says, could you create a gravitational wave by crick? by quickly removing or placing a massive object in space-time like a stone into a pond. Let me blow your mind, Panda. Everything you do creates a gravitational wave. Tiny though they may be, every every movement of mass in space-time creates a ripple of gravity. Why we only detect them when, you know, two black holes eat each other or two neutron stars collide is because the, the waves... The waves that I am making right now moving through space-time are incomprehensibly tiny, and no human-scale detector would be able to detect them accurately. And so we need really, really, really giant gravitational waves. So that's why we only detect them when, like, a neutron star blows up or hits another neutron star. Because those waves are so big, we can actually detect them with human equipment. But everything makes gravitational waves all the time. We are the stones in the pond of space-time. How big do you want your ripple to be? It's that kind of faux inspirational scientific talk that sells a lot of books for Deepak Chopra. <laughs> yeah, I'm taking shots at Deepak. I don't care. Talks a lot of nonsense. Willie Reimer says, is the butterfly effect real? Just chaos theory. I mean, one small thing changing another thing. Yeah, possible. Reese Sand says, is Kyle saying I'm fat? No, I would never body shame you on camera. That's ridiculous. I mean, be healthy. Be as healthy as you can be. It will help you in the long term with almost everything associated with health. Uh, Sleuth says, oop, are you a better Veritasium? No. Derek is... So much better than me. He's got really cute kids and a pool. Those are the only two metrics I care about. Kids and pools. And I have neither that I know of. Just a few more comments. Uh, Darren Carr says, Hey Kyle, beep beep, jumped in just after our live stream. Our live stream happy hour ended. Well, thanks for being here just for the tail end of this. Always appreciate everybody in the chat. Um, Christopher Walka says, would you ever consider switching to a plant-based diet? Um, I know what vegans and, and vegetarians say, that you can get the exact same amount of nutrition from a non-meat diet. I don't exactly buy that based on what I've seen, but I think it is important to consider ethical choices and uh manufacturing processes and killing processes um when it comes to picking your food i know it's more expensive and it can be 
but uh, I think that is important to keep in mind and make the decision for yourself um, because it's hard to argue ethics for another person. Um, I'll say this, though. I still haven't tried an Impossible Burger, and if it's better than a regular burger, why would I eat a regular burger ever again? Major Lee Awesome with the five says, shout out to Kyle's secret pool. Shut up, dude. Only like really cool peeps are allowed in there. And peeps, little ducks. They're adorable. Uh, rejected Amoeba, who spelled Amoeba wrong. It's fine. With the 999, he says, hey, Kyle, glad I got to catch you live in between studying for algebra and biomedical ethics finals. Love your content. See, we were just talking about bio bioethics. Uh, I hope you have, I, I, I hope you, Knock them out of the park. Study hard, study well. I know you got it. Uh, Luke, Luke, Luca Bazooka. Wow, I love that. If you're healthy, it will help you with everything that has to do with health. Kyle Hill 2020. Well, no, I mean in regards to like um, healthy weight. Again, I'm not calling, I wasn't calling the previous commenter fat. I'm saying being at a healthy weight for you and your body type and your body size and all the other factors that helps with everything. And as always, the final super chat coming from Music Central Piano 29 with the 5151. Wow, so consistent. Keep up the great work, Kyle. Great quotes this episode. Wear your mask, socially distance, think critically, and listen to ex experts. Nothing works unless we want it to. And with that, thank you so much for watching this episode of the Office Hours podcast. If you want to continue on this conversation, after I'm done here, you can go to patreon.com slash Kyle Hill as my security team, uh, a genetically mod modified bucket is putting in the chat right now. You can join our members only discord. You get behind the scenes stuff. Uh, you get episodes early. And this week's episode is all about, as we talked a little bit about today, quantum mechanics and how a specific quantum mechanical effect, effect works and how I made it work at human scale. We do all that stuff at the facility. So if you want to join us, please do. Um, we're getting, we're getting to the end of the year. It's uh, going to be a doozy. I have some absolute banger videos coming out, I think. At least, at least one. You know you know the Expanse is coming out later. You know I got to talk about that. Thinking I'm going to do a Mandalorian thing pretty quick. And you know I'm going to do Cyberpunk. And I finished filming my Cyberpunk episode two days ago. And uh, it's something. If you went on the Patreon and you saw all the blood on my hands, that had something to do with it. You can guess what it is in the comments below. Have a wonderful rest of your week. Um, social distance, wear a mask, be smart, listen to experts, be nice to each other, because this is just all we got. Take it out, new intro!